remember um, the lake was really calm that night and it was like glass and there was a stirring out in the water kind of far. And we, all of us noticed it. We're like, what is that? And my, fa my father was like, you know, I've never seen anything like this in all my years. And Thank you for joining us today. We're excited you're here to meet the author of today's book. Welcome to Digital Book Nooks, Meet the Author Show, where you can discover your next great book. With your host, D.G. Thomas. Enjoy the show. Hi, and welcome to today's Meet the Author Show. Today's featured book is a children's book written by not one author, but two and is currently in the process of being adapted into a major motion picture. I'm so excited to introduce you today to our guest authors, Richard Rossi and Kelly Tabor, who are here to discuss their book, Lucy and the Lake Monster. Richard Rossi is an Academy Award considered filmmaker. Lucy and the, Lu Lucy and the Lake Monster is his third novel. And Kelly Tabor is a retired fourth grade school teacher she searched for the sea serpent Champ in the waters of Lake Champlain as a girl, and this novel is inspired by her childhood. The book Lucy and the Lake Monster is available at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So without further ado, I wanna introduce you to our authors, Kelly and Richard. Hello, thank you for joining us today. Hi, <laughs> Dee. That's fine to be here. Thank you for having us. Oh, so excited to talk to you about the book and the filmmaking process. It's really exciting. So um, I want to start with, you know, as authors, a lot of times we write kind of on a solo, just by ourselves. It's kind of an isolated journey. Um, but what brought the two of you together and how has it been to blend your writing styles and ideas together? Mm. Ladies first, Kelly. <laughs> Well, Richard, and I, we have known each other since back in the 80s, and we got back in touch with one another, um, and I started telling Richard about some of the stories that I love telling to my fourth grade students, and one of the stories was about Champ, the Lake Champlain monster, and so Richard became very intrigued about it, and he said, well, how would you like to write a children's book series on it? And I was shocked because, first of all, I've always loved to write. And to be asked by somebody such as Richard to write with, I mean, I was just overjoyed. And, and I said, are you serious? <laughs> you know, because an opportunity like this doesn't come along in a lifetime. Rarely it comes along. And so I just, I said, yes. And so it's just been such a joy to write with him. He's so creative and I love being creative too. I've always wanted to write anyway. And Richard is what it took to help me and encourage me along to actually um, accomplish one of the dreams that I had. So thank you, Richard. Well, thank you because you inspired the story. As uh, Dee said, with your childhood, you were the muse and the catalyst to this uh, Lucy and the Lake Monster. Oh, well, I guess Champ was too. My friend Champ was kind of a catalyst too. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> we both do. Oh, that's awesome. How um, So how do you um, work out your writing styles? I know you both have your own unique um, styles. Um, mm -hmm. How do you blend those together in a story? Did you well, we've, done, we've done most of it long distance. Um, mm -hmm. he, he talked to me a lot over the phone and would interview me different questions and different things about um, me actually looking for champ when I was little things that I'd gone through. And, and so he would pen down the things that I'd write. And then when he would come up with some ideas, we would come together again and we would decide on how to write certain parts and how to change certain parts so that we both liked it and agreed. And, and it was just a wonderful experience because we work really well together. Okay. Don't you agree, Richard? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I'd never heard about this guy, Champ, the plesiosaur mm -hmm. in the lake. And um, 
the writing process was for me, it, I never really collaborated on something this long with someone. I had songwriting partners. I've written a lot of music, particularly a friend of mine, John Walker, and I wrote hundreds of songs together. So I collaborated on the short form of a song, but this was a whole new experience to actually collaborate on a novel because my novels before, I wrote a couple other novels, as you mentioned, D. Stickman and uh, Canaan were very solitary, just me. And I kind of liked that uh, at the time because I also direct films and, and movie making is very collaborative and I had to deal with many different personalities and egos. And so it was kind of like a respite from dealing with a large group of people to just be all by myself and write a novel. So this was quite an interesting thing. I've never written, you know, a, a whole book with somebody else, but, you know, Kelly's been the, the most supportive best friend, uh, a very Christ-like person who's always been loving and supportive from the first day I met her. And I thought, well, if anyone could be, if, if I could tolerate anyone for a long book writing journey, it would, it would be Kelly Tabor. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I think that's amazing um, just to have someone to bounce those ideas off of and to have that feedback along the way, I think um, makes for a more enriching story, I think. So um, speaking of the story, can you all tell us about the plot of your of the book? I'll be happy to go first. Okay. Well, Lucy is Lucy is a nine year old, and she's an orphan, and she is on a quest to find the Lake Champlain monster. But she's had to undergo some tragedies in her life. She's lost her father, and she's also lost her mother, who was searching for Champ when she lost her life, and so. Lucy um, deals with the loss of parents, but she's been adopted by her grandfather, which is Papa Jerry. Richard plays Papa Jerry in the movie, <laughs> and he does it so well. That's why he grew his beard. <laughs> 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 yes, and and so they both undergo obstacles along the way, and and they have to overcome these, and it's it's their quest to find Champ even though they're going through these difficult times. And so as a school teacher, I always, I saw students going through different, through different things. So I told Richard, I really, really want part of this book and film series to show ways that children can overcome some of these difficulties that they're going through. Right. Because in the classroom, I saw firsthand some of the things that the kids go through, like mm -hmm. grief and um, sorrow, bullying, you know, and it's difficult for kids to go through those things. As an adult, sometimes when we see a child going through something small, we, we may think it's small, but to a child, it's something really difficult. And so we had um, Emma Pearson, who played Lucy in the movie. Mm -hmm. You know, she's so good at what she does with acting. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and Emma did a phenomenal job with the expressions on her face, just like she was living it, living the problems that she was going through. And Papa would help her as she went through these things and give suggestions and wisdom. And so the people that are reading this book, whether they're children or if an adult is reading it to a child or if adults reading it, you know, we all go through those kinds of things. And so hopefully it will help any reader when they're reading, you know, so that it will benefit and make their life a little bit easier and most, more enjoyable to face. Okay. Richard, did you have anything you want to add to that? Um, yes. Um, sometimes there's a, a verse of um, Corinthians that says, sometimes God chooses those considered foolish to confound the wise. And I think it's also a story about misfits that are bullied and underestimated. Um, Papa Jerry is considered an eccentric. He's they're They're poor. They live in a a cabin on the lake in a very simple off the grid way. Um, and he's made fun of for his old beat up $8 guitar and his uh, old beat up boat. He calls old skiff or Gramps boat. And um, they're considered kind of eccentrics that have a strange belief, you know, looking for this sea serpent champ. And I think a important theme is for people to believe and follow their own heart, you know, because there's a lot of um, judgment in society now if you believe or think differently. I guess there always has been. Um, you know, I use the example historically of uh, Galileo and Copernicus believed the earth revolved around the sun. 
and they were excommunicated in, in, um, by the church and by other people because people felt their view was against the Bible at the time. Uh, there was a scripture about the sun setting still and stopping its movement so Joshua would, ha would have an extra day to win the battle. So they said, you're wrong. The, the <laughs> earth does not revolve around the sun. The Bible refutes that. And, you know, hundreds of years later, the Pope said, I guess we were wrong about that. And, you know, I know we excommunicated and damned Galileo and Copernicus, but, you know, they got to get out of jail free card and that, you know, they're no longer uh, excommunicated. But, but, you know, kids sometimes that are special, more creative, more sensitive, need to know that that's okay, that they're different, that they think differently, that they don't follow the crowd all the time, that they have beliefs. Um, we really want to fight bullying of any sort, discrimination, racism, bullying of anybody for mm -hmm. being different in any way with the story. I think that's a real important part of the story. Okay. I agree. Um, Kelly, uh, Lucy and the Lake Monster, speaking of childhood and children, mm -hmm. was inspired by your childhood. So can you um, tell us about your experience looking for the lake monster as a child? Oh, yes. I would, I would consider myself pretty curious growing up. And so when I heard things like uh, a monster in the lake, you know, I was interested. My father had a cabin on Lake Champlain that he and his father built when my father was just a little boy. And so when my grandparents passed away, it was left to my, my parents. And so we spent a lot of time there, even before that. In the summers, that's where I spent my summers, is right on the lake. And we always had friends over, and it was just a fun place to be. There was no electricity. Wow. <laughs> there was no running water. <laughs> but it was just the best place. I remember waking up. And the, there were two little beds. It was one room. And my mom had a little kitchen area set up where she would do her dishes. And, and there was like a little a gas stove and a gas refrigerator and a picnic table and two beds. And there was, I think, a little dresser. But up in the rafters, there were cane poles that were made by my grandfather that he used for fishing. And I remember waking up in one of those little beds. And, and the window would lift up and kind of hook to the ceiling. And I remember looking out the screen and just hearing the water lap up on the, on the rocks in the morning. It was my favorite place with the sun glistening on the waves. And I remember just hearing stories about champ and just sitting there looking and listening to the beauty of, of it all. And every time I went out, it wasn't a beach. There were rocks that you went out on and there would be campfires at night. So we spent a lot of time out on the rocks, just fishing and by the fire. And I would always look for it. I had an uncle who had seen it when he was working on the roof of his cabin. I'd had cousins that had seen it when they were fishing. Um, if the story goes right, I think, I think they were fishing and there was a, a boat with a water skier and the water skier fell down and Champ kind of came up nearby to him. And it's never hurt anybody. And I remember hearing stories when I was little that there was a school group um, swimming on the beach and they had to evacuate the beach because it had apparently, a champ had apparently um, shown himself that were out from the ropes that were there where the children had to stay within. But the children had to evacuate the beach. But it's never been known to hurt anybody. There's been... Um, my uncle had a restaurant right there in Boaga Bay where over 300 eyewitnesses had seen Champ. And it, people would laugh because there was a, it was a, a restaurant and a little bar there. And I remember when I was little, it was a really nice place to go to for dinner on a Saturday night. So I remember people used to get all dressed up and my, my grandmother and my, um, my uncle played the drums, my grandmother played the piano. And so they would have jazz music and people would waltz and dance and, it was just a, a nice place to be. And my Aunt Joan worked in the kitchen and she did all the cooking. And and so people would claim that they saw Champ from his restaurant windows. Oh. And he would have binoculars set up so that people could actually look at the tables for it. And people would laugh because when people would claim that they saw Champ from his restaurant, they'd say, oh, yeah, well, how many have you tipped back? <laughs> before you <laughs> and so it was like a running joke and so you might see part of that in the novel uh, but anyway so I just I wanted to have some things in the novel that was real realistic it's fictional but it's 
I wanted things from my childhood in there too. And Richard was all for it. But I just always looked for champ whenever I was on the lake. I always looked and looked. And it wasn't until I was uh, later in life when I think I may have seen the effects of champ. Mm-hmm. Um, I had some friends that were at my dad's cabin. And, and I remember um, the lake was really calm that night. And it was like glass. And there was a string out in the water kind of far. And we, all of us noticed it. We're like, what is that? And my, fa- my father was like, you know, I've never seen anything like this in all my years. And so he always had a pair of binoculars hanging on the nail on this front porch. And so um, my friend had her camera all ready for the million dollar picture. (laughs) (laughs) And I had my camera set up and it was a, it was like a wake. It was coming straight at us, but it never surfaced. It was about a two inch wake that came and it never went up and down, never went side to side. And it just came straight for us and made a 90 degree turn and then just kept going in a straight line to the next point. And we were all just waiting for it to come up. And I thought, what in the world goes in a straight line? A fish goes side, their tail goes side to side. I don't know what it could have been other than the effects of champ. So I really believe, (laughs) I want to believe it was the effects of champ. So, so that's you've never actually story. seen it. That's what you're saying. I have not, but <laughs> every time I'm, I'm still up here right now, I'm spending some time with my parents. Oh. And um, every time I go by the lake on our way to church or mm-hmm. from the next town, I I still look for that, oh, that yeah. monster. But of course, right now the lake is frozen over. Yeah. Okay. But you know, there's even been stories in the wintertime where there's ice, ice fisher, uh, fishermen out on the lake fishing, a women fish too, but they have the holes in the ice that are dug out and sometimes there'll be like a big huge shadowy black thing that'll kind of go by and people think that that might be champ too but i usually stay in in the winter time i don't go out on the <laughs> lake fishing yeah. but you know there's my story my grandfather um there's stories about him he was on his way to the mines in mineville fishing or not fishing on the way to work and they were taking a bus kind of carpooling together and the men in their saw something in the lake that looked like an overturned boat as they were going through the rock cuts because the lake's kind of close to the rock cuts there and and they believed that it was champ then and that was years and years ago and i've asked my father about stories about when he was little but back then they didn't have the communication we do today as far as technology so when people might have seen champ they didn't always tell that they saw it or people wouldn't know for a while Right. But nowadays, if there's a sighting, people know quickly because it's in the papers or people have cell phones to take what they think is a picture. Yeah. yeah. But I can go on and on. I'll stop. Well, it, it certainly <laughs> makes for an interesting basis of a story, I think so. And, and I love the, the nostalgia of the of your childhood and, and the time on the lake with your family and all that. But I know I don't look like a big camper. I went camping with my son. <laughs> And Cub Scouts, and, and it's funny, it's one of those things that I think I love more in theory than in practice, but, <laughs> but well, you it, know, it I, certainly is I, beautiful, though. Awesome. I even became a, a swimming instructor in, in Bawagi Bay when I was a teenager, and I taught children swimming lessons in that where all the sightings were, and I never saw him even during that time. <laughs> <laughs> every day and you know had all the kids looking to and you no know, in fact some of the movie is actually shot on that same beach oh great that's wonderful yeah so speaking of the movie um richard so you've written um well before i get into the movie uh you've written other novels um and this is your first i'm going to children's literature what made you decide yeah. to take on um children's literature well um you know, I thought about um, Christ's words about unless you become as a little child and how little children are our teachers. We look at ourselves as we got to kind of control and keep the kids straight. But Jesus said that being childlike is so beautiful and um, not childish, but childlike. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, last year I was in the hospital and almost died. I had a lot of uh, four surgeries. I had a beautiful surgeon, Dr. Julio, who saved my life. And I looked at the bucket list and I thought, what's something I haven't done I really want to do? And I really wanted to always do a children's book and film that adults would like as well, because all of us adults have that little child inside. Mm -hmm. And I was in a play, a musical about Alice in Wonderland as an actor 
I was portraying the role of Lewis Carroll, who wrote Alice in Wonderland. And as I did that play, I learned a lot about him and did a lot of research about him. His real name was Charles Dotson, and he was a minister. And one of the other ministers at the church in England, where he was, had several young daughters. And Alice Lydell was one of the girls that was real imaginative. And she would always tell him, you know, make up a story, tell me a story. So he would make up stories about Alice going down the rabbit hole and her adventures. And then she said, maybe you should write these stories down. So that sowed a seed in my heart that, you know, I would like to do something like this one day. Um, and Kelly's story was so perfect to me. It was like a modern day Alice in Wonderland chance for me to tell the story of, you know, a young girl like she was looking for champ. And um, I saw it as an allegory for deeper things for adults as well, because it shows the purity of a childlike heart. Because Lucy sees Champ as good, like this, she sees Champ here as her friend, and it's good. But there are mercenary people who want to capture and exploit mm -hmm. Champ, the bad guys in the story. And I thought that Champ's kind of an allegory for so many things, like God, for example, like childlike and pure people see God as love, and they focus on love, love one another, love your neighbors, yourself. But I've also, in the religious world, known preachers that are very money hungry and they're just exploiting God for money and telling people, if you don't you know, tithe so much money to me, you're under a curse and God's going to get you. And they scare people. And that's kind of like going on in the Champ story where there's this faction that wants Champ for just the money mercenary mercenary Mike and Beasel Beamish are two of the villains that just want <laughs> money from Champ. But Lucy loves Champ and it's very pure. So I think that children's stories can work on multiple levels, you know, that adults get it on one level and kids just love the story. Sure. I feel the same way. <laughs> um, so the film, so you're currently in the process of filming um, a major motion picture for Lucy and the Lake Monster. How has that been? What have been some of the challenges of adapting the book to a script to the screen? <laughs> yes. Um, well, a book, we're able to get so much more into the heads of the characters and what they're thinking. Um, on the screen, you don't, you're not able to show all that. Like, um, Papa has a background where he's a bit troubled. He's um, overcome alcoholism and some of the villains have certain reasons for hating Lucy. One of the, the women who's really vicious, Bezel Beamish, was knew Lucy's mother and they and had a jealousy going back to high school because Lucy's mother was the pretty head cheerleader and star athlete. And so she has this hatred for Lucy and her mother. And some of those kind of background and th a, a book, you can develop all that. Whereas in the film, we had just the visual aspects. How about you? Um, what would you say about that, Kelly? Well, yeah, I think, I think, like you said, the book, you're able to explain a lot. And, and when we're filming, you can act it, you can act it out. And depending on the, the level of acting and all too, um, maybe that'll come across in some ways, but the book is a little tiny bit different than the movie in parts because of those little nuances that are yeah, visually the film is really great though because you can see the lake and you can see mm -hmm. uh, the camp and you can see all these things mm -hmm. um, we filmed it in the actual town but the Waga Bay Port Henry where it took place so there's organic things when you make a film that can happen if you're open to them Orson Welles um, perhaps the greatest director of all time called them um, God's divine accidents and he said the great directors are open to God's divine accidents and he meant by that 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 little things happen as you're filming and a true artist is open to that. Like there's things that happen as we were filming that weren't in the book, but we went mm -hmm. with them and it really enhanced the film. Um, um, there, oh, I want to give an example, but I'm, I'm like thinking, Oh, it'll spoil a plot twist. No, don't give the spoiler. <laughs> no, I won't give the spoiler but like there are things that I would see as a director on set. Mm. Yes. that were happening, people, places, and things. And I thought, oh, we could do this and film a scene, blah, blah, blah. It wasn't in the book. It wasn't in the script. But those kind of divine accidents made the film uh, really come alive. I, I can't wait for people to see the film later. Yeah, this year. I, I want to say something. <laughs> Richard is so clever and smart and creative. Like 
he'll think of something on the spot oh, awesome. that isn't exactly in the script. And I think it's just wonderful because he's so creative. And like when we're in the moment, sometimes he'll get this brilliant idea and then he'll just, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to go in this direction right here. And it, it, it just makes it exciting and non boring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because he's like that. I love yeah. that about him. He's so spontaneous and, and just creative in so many ways. And, and it just makes it all the better. <laughs> all right. There's never a dull moment. I, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> and this is exciting for me because I've never done anything like this before. You know, I was a, I was a school teacher for 32 years. I taught elementary. Most of it was fourth grade. Right. And so I'm in a, and I just retired. And so oh. I'm in a totally different direction now. I'm still getting to work with kids and, yeah. and you know, in the movie and, um, being around kids when we were filming and which was exciting. So I feel like it's still there. And, and two, I'm kind of teaching along the way too. And, That's and I was like always, I was always really detailed. And, and so I got to do not only like direct with Richard, but like I got to do a lot of the extra kind of things because we are a small film. Mm -hmm. And so I was like the person that, Filling in, doing little things for my hat for always different. One thing that was spontaneous that doesn't spoil a whole lot is the bullies. When we got to set, oh, yeah. we had not cast our bullies. Mm. But the way that I, um, I found the bully, <laughs> I seen some kids playing basketball on the street, and I went over and played basketball with these boys. Oh. And um, people were thinking, what is he doing? We're supposed to be filming the <laughs> I film. Talk. I want to say something. <laughs> Go ahead. No, keep going. You're no, great. You, Go ahead. No, you continue. You pick that up. Well, we have this church in the neighborhood that was so kind to us. They let us keep our things mm -hmm. there. It's where we met, where we kept our wardrobe. Or, you know, it, it was just nice having a big area for all this kind of stuff where we could thank meet. You, we could thank, talk you, about Pastor, thank you, Pastor Rick Lewis, Lake Champlain Bible Fellowship. Fellowship. Yay. Thank you. They were awesome. And so they had a kitchen. So whenever we needed to cook, people actually stayed there. They slept there in different rooms. They had their sleeping bags. <laughs> it was just fun. And um, I remember one night we're like, well, well, one afternoon I was like, where's Richard? Where's Richard? Because um, there was so much activity there all the time. And all of a sudden, you know, Richard's gone. And they said, well, he's outside playing basketball with the boys in the neighborhood. <laughs> so I was like, and my, I had seen those boys in the neighborhood the day prior outside, and I was thinking to myself, hmm, I wonder if they would be interested in being the bullies. Well, of course, the next day, I had not said that to Richard, and the next day, Richard was out there playing basketball. In my mind, I knew, I said, I know what he's doing. He's looking for those bullies. <laughs> and sure enough, he came in, he said, I've got our bullies for the season. <laughs> Can you imagine, can you imagine how excited these little boys were? They're around, I don't know, eight, nine, I'm guessing their ages. Mm -hmm. When he said he was out there, they thought it was real cool that someone was playing basketball for, mm -hmm. with them. And then all of a sudden they're asked, hey, how would you like to be in a movie? It changed their lives. Exactly. I mean, they were probably on the phones calling their friends. Hey, guess what? <laughs> When they went back to school in August, they got to tell all their friends, hey, we were in a movie. So the news is spreading through the area and they're just delighted. And their families were, too. Mm. I mean, their families ended up helping out a lot, spreading the news. And whenever we needed something, they're like, we've got it. We've got it. I think of Brenda Baker. That was just so helpful with so many things. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> yes. Dealing with uh, our bully scene. And it was just such a pleasure. We'd pull in every day. They'd all be waving to us across the street. <laughs> we became like this big family. This uh, that's wonderful. You were able to pull in the community. Yeah. I think that it, you never know what small thing that happens for children mm -hmm. can inspire mm -hmm. them for their future. So you may have created the next, you know, the next Academy <laughs> Award winning actors. Who knows, right? Yeah, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> you it's, never really, know. It's, it's really important we nurture children's creativity. And that's what we hope to do with this book. I mean, I was fortunate enough as a boy that I was artistic and I was chosen to study art with a well-known artist and my mother took me to meet with him. And um, I, I learned music at a young age and played music professionally as a child, but I had um, that support. And um, 
you know, there's the parable of the seed and the sower that talks about one seed is nurtured and, and produces a hundredfold fruit, but other seeds are not nurtured. They're choked out by thorns and thistles or the birds snatch the seed or they're planted on rocky ground. But children, um, we have to nurture these kids and inspire them and believe in them. And, you know, like Lucy's papa, I tried to play him as like a very loving, nurturing man that when she's bullied, he and called junkie and all that stuff. I take her to a junkyard and say, Hey, there's a lot of treasures in this junkyard and, <laughs> and, and God don't make junk. Like, he always is that person that she can come to. Mm -hmm. you know? So I hope, I really, I really hope this book is helps children. And I worry about children. I think about children a lot in terms of like, you know, how sad it is when they don't have that, you know, that nurturing, um, you know, we had an incident out here of a, a, a precious little boy who was killed by um, a, a, the mother's boyfriend who had a violent temper and beat him. And that's a very extreme example. But I also worry about people who have children and, 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 and verbally abuse them or physically abuse them or, or emotionally or abuse them or abuse them in other even more horrific ways. Or I think about children that are taught negative things about themselves and taught a lot of shame and self-loathing and um, negativity. And, um, you know, with, um, with my son and daughter, I tried my best to always praise them and build them up and show them love. And, you know, uh, I, I believe that um, this book hopefully will let children know it's okay. And I love that children like it. I'm reading reviews from people. I got this for my grandchildren and they love the book. That's, oh. that's for me, like hitting a home run. That's the best, yes. best review. I feel the same way. Mm -hmm. I get excited when I see another review written. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it's great to see the feedback from the readers. And especially, I think it's especially rewarding as a children's author to hear that feedback from the children that, you know, that they enjoy the story since, I mean, we want everybody to get something out of the story, but when particularly that that um, we're able to connect with our children audience, I think it's it's a wonderful feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the people that touch us as children, we remember them. Yeah. You know, like I'm so fond of them. I I live in Hollywood, and sometimes I meet actors and become friends with them that I loved as a kid, and I get really starstruck if it's an actor that I liked as a little boy, mm -hmm. like. Like I could meet Tom Cruise or some A-list actor and it doesn't really phase or excite me as much as nothing against Tom Cruise is a good actor, but I'm much more excited. Sometimes I'll be out in a restaurant and I'll meet somebody that I liked as a show I watched when I was five and right. then they're like 90 years old. Out. I'm like, oh my God. You know, yeah, so like Dick Van Dyke, who I loved in Mary Poppins. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, you know, I got to meet him. It's like, oh my God, you know, because <laughs> Touched me as a little boy, you know, right. and so it's really important that we children, the memories they have of books like, for example, the first books I really got into were the Hardy Boys mystery series. Hmm. And when I went to the library and I saw the Hardy Boys on the shelf, I felt that magical feeling I did as a little boy when I got to read that first the Tower Treasure, Frank and Joe Hardy, <laughs> you know, and uh, so it's really important what what we do. And you also as a children's writer, if I'm allowed to say that, D, it's mm -hmm. it's really important that we're sowing these good seeds into children. Definitely. I agree. Most definitely. Yeah. And I want to say too, the people of the communities around here, Crown Point, Port Henry, um, even in Ticonderoga, you know, the people have been very supportive. I think of the people that um, allowed us to use their places. Mm -hmm. There's Mark and Alita and Rick. And, um, you know, they both had cabins, and so we were able to use their places, and it, mm. everything just worked out perfectly. And the people in the town, the restaurants we went to, we ate, um, they were excited to see our crew coming in every day. And um, I remember uh, Rick, one of the one of the men that ha um, allowed us to use his cabin, he's a school teacher, and he's already read our novel to his class. Oh, wow. And he had said how much the class liked it. And I was just so excited to hear that, to know that, you know, it's even going to be possibly in schools for kids to read and libraries. I know that all the local libraries around here, um, many of them, Richard and I, um, 
delivered libra- or the book to their library so they would have a book in their libraries. But um, it's just exciting yeah. to know that it's being read in school. I, want, I, I told <laughs> Kelly, I want to make sure we give this to the libraries for the kids that might not have money to buy the book. And libraries are my favorite place in the world. Um, Kelly said, heaven for me. <laughs> When she she said if when you when you pass the he- heaven and the afterlife for you Richard would be going to a giant library. Oh, and Jesus said, "I'm going away. And I'm going to prepare a place." You, I said, "Your place, God has prepared for you, is the heavenly library that <laughs> 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 maybe you're going to be in charge of." And so Richard was so excited; he was like a kid at Christmas when I told him. They said, "Oh, that would be great." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just love, I go to the library all the time, and um, books are great. I mean, our, our book, Lucy in the Lake Monster, of course, is on Kindle and Nook and the reading mm-hmm. devices, but I am quite biased to hold this the paperback <laughs> or the hardback in your hand and right. smell it, open those but pages. Those libraries. And, and you're <laughs> right, especially um, like in the local areas, to read a story that they can relate to because they see the mm. oh the lake and all that and they mm. can identify with that the students and so um I can imagine that would be really exciting to read to hear a story. Yeah, and, but, and the photography of the area of the lake in Port Henry was captured beautifully. Um Daniel Burke, who shout out to Daniel M, um, who was the cinematographer, shot it on black magic cameras, some of the best cameras. And so it's going to look really beautiful, the film That's itself. Fun. Um and um I, I felt uh a wonderful uh, connection that um, the lead actress, uh, Emma Pearson, a fine young actress. In fact, tonight she's on a big CBS show um, um, on uh, at 10 o'clock. But um, Emma is a fine actress and her and I have a wonderful uh, bond in the scenes where you can you can feel the connection between Papa and his granddaughter, Lucy. And it's rock solid. Uh, Emma's performance in connection with me as Papa is rock solid all the way through the film, which is, of course, very important. Okay. So can our viewers go to your website to learn more about the film, when it'll be released? Yes. um, Our website is LucyInTheLakeMonster.com. Okay. And we have a Facebook page, which is Facebook.com slash Champ Movie. Champ is the name of the sea serpent. Mm -hmm. And then our Instagram and Twitter are both champ movie hq hq stands for headquarters and um they can google lucy and the lake monster too and they'll find a plethora of so many articles we've been very blessed to get a lot of coverage and i know how lucky we are because i have fellow filmmaker friends here in hollywood that cuss me out (laughs) they call me up and cuss me out and i won't (laughs) stay on the air being a gentleman but they'll say who's your bleepity bleeping publicist Mm. I'll say, I, I guess it's God because I don't have a publicist on the teener. We've got the best one. Yes, right. <laughs> and they'll say, how are you? the most well-connected one, right? <laughs> yeah, how are you getting, we've got like front page um, newspaper oh, wow. articles and major newspapers. And of course, we're so fortunate to have good people like you interview us, D, because people like you that write books, love books, you give the best interviews and questions because you're a reader, you're a writer. Um, Leaders are readers and people that read really promote reading, you know, because I mean, quite frankly, in the major uh, media, like when you get up to like the national level, major media, you would think that would be even more so, but it's actually less. So a lot of them, they're just like handed a a little uh, cheat sheet, Mm. you know, with a few uh, uh, bullet points to ask. But it's the people who really love books and ask the intelligent questions like you do that help people really get the background of the book, you know? Thank you very much. And I appreciate you all both being on the show today. Um, for our listeners today, the, I would love to talk to you all day long. This is very interesting. <laughs> you know, I do got to tell you real quick. Have, the there are more questions on. on the blog, on the Digital Book Nook blog. Oh, That'll follow up. So um, I so- do want to tell you, D, your theme song rocks. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that has like the best groove. Oh, my God. As a musician, I was sitting here, you know. Wow. Thank you. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> he's probably going to try to play it when he gets off air because he's, okay. he's a professional guitarist, too. Yes, See, I really look. Oh, I, okay. I was figuring it out as it was. I knew it. I knew it. I could read him like a book. 
<laughs> oh, it's so funny. But I want to put the book up on the screen. I want to say thank, thank you all you. again for, for joining me today on the show. And um, for everyone watching today, uh, the book can be found at Amazon and Barnes and Noble. The website is lucyandthelakemonster.com. And give you a second to take a look at that. And once again, um, thanks again for watching the show. Um, please visit the Digital Book Nook blog to be able to read the remainder of the, um, of the interview with Richard and Kelly. And Richard and Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thanks again to our watchers, our everyone watching, and um, have a good day.